The following talk is offered freely to ensure that no one is ever denied access to these practices and to these teachings. If you feel inspired to make a donation to support this offering, you can go to my website at jonathanfaust.com. While you're there, you can also sign up for a monthly newsletter designed to support you in your practice. Thank you, and enjoy. I have the, the great good fortune of paddling on the Potomac River um, pretty much every day when I can. And one of the things I love about paddling on a river is the river is very alive. The Potomac will flood sometimes. I mean, it'll will get. it's not uncommon to have it go up 5 or 10 feet, um, and then it'll go quite a bit lower. And we get the migrating birds and changing seasons. It's just one of my favorite things in the world. And it's interesting how sometimes when it's flooded, it's really, really hard to paddle out there because there's just a lot, of, a lot of flow. But it's equally hard sometimes when the flow is really low because you can only get up through certain channels and it's a little bit like paddling up a, up a garden hose. <laughs> the other day... The flow is pretty moderate right now, but going upstream is pretty tough. So I was <clears throat> working pretty hard to uh, to get to where I wanted to go. I have a couple of favorite spots I like to check out. And so working, 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 working. And then finally, I kind of reached my spot and I stopped. And I noticed that as soon as I, as soon as I stopped, there was this flood of sensation. Just all the bird song came rushing in and the awareness of the temperature of the air and the light and all the all the richness of the experience was suddenly available to me because I had moved from doing into more of a sense of being. As I like to say, uh, one of the things I love about yoga is uh, how good it feels when I stop doing yoga. <laughs> and this is an this is an essential part of of any practice of conscious effort, and then conscious relaxation and conscious receiving. We've been talking over these last weeks about these seven factors of awakening, and I'd like to talk now a little bit about this factor of calming, sometimes described as cultivating tranquility or or cultivating relaxation. And what I'd like to cover in the little bit of time I have with you is to talk about the power of calming, what you can actually do through cultivating this, I was going to say muscle, or this reflex of letting go, Uh, some of the techniques for calming, some of the challenges in calming, and then some strategies that might be really helpful for you. About five years ago, a good friend of mine, Matt Ostreicher, um, ashram friend, had asked me, if I would be interested in hosting his vision for uh, a spiritual late night talk show. I loved the idea and he and I would chat about it over the years. And, and then at one point I said, look, I, I really want to do this. Would you be up for it? And I was really quite reticent. You know, I explained, I, I have a face made for radio, uh, not for video. And, um, and as we went back and forth, and he said, no, we're looking for a cool professor type, so we, we think you'd be great. <laughs> so I don't know why, but I said, okay. And I didn't realize just how big the production was. You know, we kicked back ideas around what it would look like, and, and I loved the idea. The idea was that it would, it would create some interviews that would go deeper than your traditional you know, late-night talk show, more like little mini TED Talk experiences. And it would feature uh, a social activist, a spiritual teacher, uh, an artist, and a scientist. And would have great music. It would have a great, a great band. It seemed like a really, really cool idea. So we were going to do a pilot and see what happens. And, and actually, the pilot has just been released. So if you'd like to go to my, go to my Facebook page, um, you can find it. It's called One With Anything. One, one, one With Everything. <laughs> And 
So I made my way up to the Bijou Theater in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is a kind of a good sized theater. And um, I was surprised how big the theater was. And I was surprised at how big the band was. And Matt was the music director for the Apollo Theater. And he's an amazing musician. And there was this amazing band, an amazing singer, as they were kind of warming up and so forth. And before the show started, I was backstage and the band kicked in and it was amazing. The whole theater was just rocking. People were, were standing up and, and dancing and I was supposed to open the show in a few minutes. And I had a very, very profound moment where I thought, what am I doing here? <laughs> you ever have that experience? Like, what am I doing? How did I get here? What, what am I going to, what am I going to do? I'll come back to what I did. <laughs> but one of the elements when we are under duress is learning how to calm ourselves, learning how to cultivate relaxation, how to soothe the mind. Of course, we have all kinds of ways of soothing the mind that aren't so wholesome. One of mine was get more work done, which doesn't work that well. But with so much going on in the world right now, so much conflict, so much fear, so much anxiety, so much polarization going on, calming is really important. But it's also a little bit contradictory because there are those who are saying with all that's going on in the world right now, now is not the time to be slowing down. Now is the time to step up and be active. And that's true. But calm and relaxation and tranquility can dramatically inform your effectiveness in the world. It's not just what you do, but it's how you do it. And this is where the whole idea of self-care comes in as part of the spiritual journey. Self-care so you can keep your heart open how to keep your heart awake in the midst of so many inclinations to just want to shut it down. So it's easy to feel angry. It's really, really easy these days to feel disassociated, to not want to feel. And it's so easy to feel shut down. So this practice of cultivating this tranquility in the body, this calming is so, so important right now. Learning how to calm in the midst of upheaval can help you not only be present for yourself, but it can help you be there for the people you care about. You know, we talked about that beautiful teaching from Thich Nhat Hanh about how with the boat people under incredible duress from pirates and from weather, that if there was one calm person in the boat, the boat would be calm. And the question becomes, can you, how can you be the calm person in your boat? So there's some great techniques out there for calming. Before I joined the Peace Corps and I went off to West Africa, I was living in New Mexico and kind of befriended this older guy who had a little New Age bookstore. And he said, you know, you're going to need some some techniques. So he taught me some Tai Chi. And it was really interesting. I, I, I kind of, I enjoyed the practice and I said, well, is this really helpful? Like it doesn't seem like it's really going to be very, very helpful if you're under attack. And he goes, well, he said, there was someone who, who studied with me for a while, you know, learning the learning Tai Chi. That one time he's walking down the street and someone did try to attack him. And then he said suddenly the, the training just kind of kicked in and he found himself very organically finding a way to kind of navigate that situation. And it's interesting because as I was standing backstage with kind of pounding music and about to run out center stage and take my mark and start telling jokes, feeling my... Uh, my blood pressure up and feeling myself kind of caught in doubt, I realized I need to calm myself. And so my training kicked in, my, my meditation training. Breath, slowing down the breath. 
So I just took a few slow, deep breaths. I could immediately begin to feel, number one, I was more embodied, more aware, more aware of the tension, but I was also a little bit more aware of kind of the calm behind the tension. And then my training in walking meditation kicked in, and so I was able to do a little mindful walking. So just in those moments, walking and breathing in the darkness, in the meantime, with this band, the noise on the other side of the curtain, I began to feel a sense of calm. So breathing is so powerful. And if you like, let's just do one little experiment, if you would. This will take about 75 seconds. If you can close your eyes, notice, notice where you feel the breath right now. Where is it the most predominant? And then if you would, take three slow, deep, and smooth breaths right now. And if you would, just feel if there's any shift. So if you like, you can open your eyes. How you breathe tends to reflect how you feel. Standing backstage, all kind of wound up and wondering, why am I here? I was barely breathing. My breath was really shallow. And any time you're upset, any time you're feeling separate, any time you're feeling anxiety, chances are your breath it will be compromised in some way. Any... <clears throat> Anytime you're breathing slow and full and deep and smooth, chances are you're going to feel a little more present, a little more here. So breath is very, very powerful. And if you've done any yoga, you know there's a whole system of breathing techniques that are designed to shift not only your nervous system, but shift your consciousness. And so the breath is very, very critical and important in meditation practice as well. It's a technique for calming. And, and here, what I find quite often is if I do some controlled breathing in the beginning and then shift to non-controlled breathing, something very powerful occurs. So, so here are the instructions from the Anapanasati Sutta. I'm going to change the pronoun a little bit. Breathing in long. She discerns, I am breathing in long. Breathing in short, she discerns, I am breathing in short. She trains herself, I will breathe in sensitive to the entire body. She trains herself, I will breathe in calming body, bodily fabrication. She trains herself, I will breathe in sensitive to rapture. She trains herself, I will breathe in sensitive to pleasure. She trains herself, I will breathe in sensitive to mental fabrication. She trains herself, I will breathe in calming mental fabrication. So the breath becomes this amazing tool. And if you like, again, you can just close your eyes. We'll just review these kind of from the inside. So if you close your eyes, again, let the breath be utterly natural and free-flowing and effortless. Notice if you're breathing in long or if you're breathing in short. Is it possible to breathe in sensitive to the whole entire body? Can you imagine as you breathe a sense of calming the body? Can you sense as you breathe in being sensitive to an, an inner sense of joy?
Can you imagine as you breathe being sensitive to pleasure? Can you imagine breathing in sensitive to the movement of the mind? And can you imagine breathing as you calm the movement of the mind? If you like, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes. Aware of breath, aware of the whole body, aware of the movement of the mind. These are essential qualities of this practice. If you've ever had someone say to you, take 10 breaths before you say something in anger, it works. And if you really do it, you might even forget what you were so angry about in the beginning. So the teachings talk about calming the body and also talk about calming the mind. And of course, they're inextricably linked, but it's helpful just to go for the body. Because if you calm the calm inside, chances are very, very good that you'll also calm the arising of mind, the arising of emotion. So calming is a critical factor in, in awakening. Agitation is soothed when it's relaxed and when it feels connected. When you cultivate calm and tranquility, it's almost as if you're inviting the restless mind back to settle. Calm and tranquility are really powerful shifts, and, and they're even more powerful when you combine them with attention and concentration. But like anything, calm and tranquility and relaxation have to be held in balance. So again, as I was backstage, walking, breathing, they really helped. Uh, I actually started to feel good. And, and paradoxically, just like when I was paddling up the river, focus, 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 and then stopped, my awareness became super heightened backstage. It was kind of this a blissful feeling started to arise, like, oh my gosh, there's so much energy here. The feeling was so good, and, and, and in a way, it would have been tempting just to kind of stay with that blissful feeling, maybe even lie down and take a nap. <laughs> but I, I had to call on that tranquility in order to respond. And then the response came. Joseph said in his great voice, Welcome to One With Everything, and now your host, Jonathan Faust, and I ran out center stage and, and jumped in. I was so grateful to have had that moment of collecting myself. I can't imagine how it would have been otherwise. So it's about remembering, remembering ease. And one of my, one of my teachers talks about how this, this word ease is, is kind of a mantra for him. So you might again, just to kind of close your eyes and, and again, take three slow, deep breaths. And on the exhalation, you might just gently say the word ease. And allow yourself to feel. Can you feel the effect of, of calming? of opening into relaxation. Then again, as you're ready, you can deepen your breath and open your eyes. Quite often we get so wound up that moving into relaxation just feels really, really good. 
it's not uncommon, of course, to find the relaxation taking you into sleep. And that's where the, the whiplash meditation comes in. And quite often when you begin to calm, your body recognizes this is a doorway and then it it's going to go for it and you'll go into a, you'll go into deep deep sleepy meditation but when it's combined with enough energy it's such a great feeling and in your meditation practice you may notice that that in that sense of enjoying the tranquility and calm there can be an upwelling just this upwelling of well-being there can be a natural sense of gratitude and and, and well-wishing and paradoxically, and this is such a paradox, it can open up this incredible doorway into deeper and deeper concentration. The more you relax, the more you feel. The more you feel, the more you notice. The more engaged you get into what you notice, the more absorbed you get. The more absorbed you get, the more bliss can arise. But an interesting thing occurs when you begin to explore cultivating tranquility and calm and relaxation and combining it with concentration is these states of, of joy, of rapture begin to arise and they come with a side effect called attachment. It's very, very easy to get attached to kind of the non-ordinary states that arise through combining tranquility and concentration. Next week, I'll be talking about concentration, a little bit more about that. But, but for now, just remember that calm and tranquility go hand in hand with the concentration practice. They're incredibly powerful states that can arise when you combine these two. The calming, again, is, I find it helpful to think of it as a physical sense of tranquility. So it's about sensing in the body, using the breath as a way to bring in a sense of here and now. The sense of tranquility can be like on a really, really hot day, just slipping into kind of cool water and holding your experience, holding that sense of tranquility becomes a practice almost unto itself. And so... In this practice, as we've talked about these factors of awakening, first you establish mindfulness, kind of non-judging awareness of what it's like to be present to what's here without the filter of greed, hatred, or delusion. When you do that, it begins to open up your experience and you begin to recognize what's actually happening. And here you call on the next factor of investigation. Wow, let me let me have tea with this. Let me look a little closer at what's going on. And as you look closer, there's kind of an energetic response where you actually feel more energy. There can be almost a like a joy of discovery that can arise in your practice. It actually feels really good to be in the here and now. And this can arise into a sense of settling. And it was just a sense of like this is a good place to be right now. And here, in this place of this is the right time, you can move deeper and deeper <clears throat> into your experience. So the middle way, relaxed and alert. What a cool combination. Deeply relaxed, at the same time alert. It's always seemed kind of contradictory. But when you bring those two together, it's very, very powerful. And again, if you find yourself moving too much into relaxation, there's almost a sense of disengagement. But it's a tool that you can use that can really impact <clears throat> your effectiveness in the world. So I'd like to share in the little bit of time I have left some of the strategies, a few more strategies for for calming. There's a story that I like to tell. My God, one of my fascinations in life is this balance of intuition with mindfulness. 
And there's a story of this um, salesman had um, had an appointment with an executive. And this, the executive of this company, the CEO, was really well known for taking disparate ideas and then putting them together, packaging them, and making a lot of money. And he went in to the secretary um, and announced that he was there. And the secretary said, well, um, he's in his idea room. And I don't know when he'll be out, so you just have to wait in the waiting room. So he did. And we thought, the idea room? <laughs> After a little while, the secretary told him it was fine to go in, and he went in to do his presentation. But before he began, he said, your secretary told me you were in your idea room. What's that, if you don't mind? And so the CEO said, well, let me show you. And there was a little, little, tiny little room kind of adjoining his office, and in it was a cot, a table, a chair, a yellow legal pad, and a pen. That's it. He said, so this is your idea room? He said, yeah. So what I do is when I have some decisions I need to make or there's just something, some part of the puzzle that hasn't come together yet, what I like to do is to go outside for a vigorous walk And then I just go into my idea room and I lie down on that cot and I wait. This is what relaxation and tranquility can do. Learning how to set it all down. And as I like to say, you can't make intuition happen, but you can cultivate the environment for it to happen. And so for him... That practice of having having an issue, having a question, and then energizing himself, and then just relaxing, then the ideas would flow. Then the shift in awareness would flow when all the different little data points would start to come together in his consciousness. As Einstein said, no problem was solved in the same consciousness that created it. And for him, this was a technique for shifting his consciousness, which which worked. And so it opens up a really interesting question. Giving all the stressors that are going on in your life right now, how can you access your own intuition? How can you access your own inner knowing? So when you explore relaxation and calming, it's helpful sometimes to do an inventory. What is taking you away from from cultivating more relaxation in your life? Sometimes just writing it down can be helpful. (laughs) What is between you and feeling calm? What's between you and feeling tranquil? And sometimes just naming it, sometimes some actions can be really, really helpful. Then it opens up the next thing, the next question, which is what do you need in order to cultivate more calm in your life? Maybe it's some kind of a lifestyle shift. Maybe it's about finding like-minded people who might kind of support you. What do you need to cultivate more calm and more relaxation? On a very practical level, in my own meditation practice, I use calming techniques at the beginning of my meditation. And if you've done meditation with me, you know that pretty much every time I'll do some form of body scan, just moving through the body and just sensing what's there. And again, just drawing attention to these different body parts can be a very, very helpful way of sort of shifting attention. And quite often I'll do more more conscious breathing at the beginning of a meditation practice. I once had a conversation with uh, kind of a, a well-known teacher who leads lots of long retreats. And, and, and he said to me, this is before I moved down to Washington, D.C., 
You know, he said, you know, for someone living in a busy urban environment, a meditation practice alone may not be the right practice because there's so much tension that we tend to build up in life that it might require more, more movement. It might actually, you might need more yoga or more physical practice in order to release those deep seated tensions. And certainly I have found that to be helpful. If you've ever noticed how your meditations are better after you've worked out or after you've done yoga, it's part of the science of yoga is release the deep seated tensions and then use breath as a way to shift your nervous system. And then you can move into meditation after you've created the, the release of tension, after you've sort of entrained the mind through breathing, after you've cultivated a sense of more self-awareness, then you can move into concentration and open into more of an allowing space. So if you're having some challenge opening into calming and tranquility and relaxation, I would highly suggest you look at ways that you can work with your body because the body and mind are deeply related. And you might find it really, really helpful to focus on releasing those gross, deep-seated tensions. Another element that's really, really important in, in practice is to notice that, that when you do some techniques of calming, to really pay attention to the effect. Even just taking three deep breaths and then just noticing the effect is a way of sort of almost reprogramming the mind, remembering that this is kind of a beautiful go-to technique. One of my favorite little techniques is when my phone rings, take one breath before I pick it up. And just notice how just one conscious breath can cultivate a shift. And for a while, I, I um, trained myself to uh, set my, my, um, my watch to set off a, a, an alarm every hour. And I would just take, take between one and three deep breaths. And most of the time, it was really annoying, but sometimes it really made a difference. As I like to say, now when anyone's wristwatch alarm goes off, I automatically take a breath. I was raised a Quaker, and we always had a, a few moments of silence before every meal. And I've only now begun to recognize how important that was. Every meal, just the pause, the calming, and then the opening into new possibility. You might explore in your practice as well, just using the sense of the word ease, or just let it be, as a little mantra in your practice. Cultivating calm and relaxation, cultivating tranquility, is not just about helping you fall asleep. It's not just about helping you be a little more vibrant and alive. It's really about going deeper and deeper into these undercurrents of well-being and presence. These seven factors are, are natural fac faculties. You don't have to strain to create mindfulness or non-judging awareness. Non-judging awareness is actually it's kind of who you are in the absence of stress. Cultivating a sense of investigation, of, of looking closer at what's actually happening. Again, it's a natural faculty of the mind. The mind is naturally curious. Cultivating energy and vitality. Well, it's who you are in the absence of stress. It's not so much about doing as it is about being right here about allowing things to, to show themselves. And again, with these seven factors of awakening, they're kind of in contrast to these five hindrances of aversion, of craving, of restlessness and worry, of sloth and torpor, of doubt. These are the factors that kind of get in the way of being present. So part of the practice is being aware of those states 
and recognizing that the covering of these states, the, 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 the covering or the occlusion in your experience, in the absence of them, all these qualities are already here. And so the interesting thing is that we tend to fall into these two, two natural categories in meditation. We tend to think of calming meditation as separate. It's going to refer to a shamatha. And an insight meditation, or vipassana, as two kind of distinct practices. So one of them is about, about, about calming and cultivating a sense of, of peace and internal happiness. And then insight is about kind of the clear understanding of what's arising. And it's really, really, really helpful to recognize they're intimately intertwined. That using the techniques of calming are what creates the foundation or, or, or the most optimal environment for insight to occur to train yourself to arrive, to really arrive where you can receive the moment as it is, is a natural step into your capacity to recognize what's true. So, another little quote from the Anapanasati Sutta. For one enraptured at heart, the body grows calm and the mind grows calm. When the body and mind of a monk enraptured at heart grow calm, then serenity as a factor for awakening becomes aroused. You can develop it. And it can go all the way to the culmination of development. For one who is at ease, body calm, the mind becomes concentrated. When the mind of one who is at ease, body calmed, becomes concentrated, then concentration as a factor for awakening becomes aroused. You can develop it, and it can go to the culmination of development. This practice is about balance, all about the middle way. Such a beautiful articulation. Deeply relaxed, at the same time alert, calm and tranquil, at the same time one-pointed. They seem contradictory, but in the fusion or in the blend of these contradictions is where amazing possibility can arise. Let's close with a short meditation and we'll sense if in some way we can internalize this. If you like, once again, you can close your eyes and you might take three slow and full deep breaths. And as you breathe out, you might just sense a quality of ease, a quality of letting be. And as you sense the body, sense the breath, effortless and free-flowing. Noticing when the breath is long. Noticing when the breath is short. As you breathe, is it possible to allow a sense of calm to spread through the body. Noticing the natural movement of the mind, and as you breathe, is it possible to calm the mind? deeply relaxed and at the same time alert 
And you might gently guide your attention to a focal point, to the breath or sound or feeling. And then if you would, is it possible in this next minute or so to embrace both deep relaxation and the sense of one-pointed attention? And now let all technique fall away. You might take a moment just to sense all the challenges in your life right now. All the fluctuations in your life, in our culture. And can you imagine in the midst of your life, your commitments, your responsibilities, your relationships, that you might in some way quicken your attention to calming and relaxation. Knowing the more you relax, the more you can feel and recognize what is here. And you might, in your own way, call on some quality of loving presence, kindness, compassion, and joy. And imagine your experience as you calm, as you rest in presence, to suffuse your experience with a sense of kindness or empathy or compassion. And just as Thich Nhat Hanh spoke of, if there is one calm person in a boat, the whole boat would stay calm. Can you imagine that calm person in the boat being you? You might fully be there for yourself and for those you care most about those who look to you. In these final moments, you might, in your own way, wish yourself well. Imagine your capacity for calm and peace and ease to grow and expand, to widen and deepen. And offer that well-wishing out to those in your inner circle and radiating out in all directions to all beings. May all beings open to this inner state of presence. May all beings feel free and at peace. In your own time now, you might deepen your breath. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you so much for your time and attention. It's such a pleasure to share these practices and these teachings with you. May your calm, may your tranquility, may your inner peace suffuse your life and inform everything that you do. Thank you so much, and take good care.